We're all set. Thanks. So I want to put um, the, the opportunity of the city's new 10-year plan in context uh, for us. And uh, I just need to, uh, are we, all right. So I want to put it in this context. You know, how do we think about the housing issues facing the city, um, cities ha including the city's housing role in relation to others? Let me back up. Sorry, kind introduction by Jeremy. I just want to mention that, so I work on affordable housing issues at Wellesley Institute here in Toronto. I have previously worked for the city and been a housing consultant and done a PhD at U of T. So uh, back to here where we are. You know, how do we think about this? And reflecting on the major policy moves of the last two decades um, and on kind of where the existing or prior uh, city tenure housing plan fit and the new one and what are the different possibilities today. Um, so it is two decades, 21 years since amalgamation and the hot 10-year plan, Housing Opportunities Toronto came sort of halfway between then and now. And we've had, you know, quite a few, I think, things we could call strategic moves. So I want to touch on those. Um, I'll also, if there's time at the end, touch briefly on three areas of affordable housing that I think other speakers won't, won't uh, emphasize. So if you think about housing needs, and I know that this is mostly a recap, I think, for most of the audience. I won't dwell on it. But, you know, there are sort of enduring issues that are almost eternal issues in modern urban societies and long-run trends of the past generation or more and sort of medium-term trends of the past five or ten years. Um, you know, the enduring issues constrain choices and an affordability squeeze for people with lower incomes, right? Also, GTA, Greater Toronto Housing Issues, felt most acutely in the city for reasons of the composition of stock and other factors. And, you know, so here on the right, three, 300,000, more or less, 300,000 households in uh, the Toronto area who can't afford market rents, really. And point to note, you know, the city grows. The city, city region grows by 35, 40,000 households a year. About 10% of those average are growth added to that, that bottom bracket we just mentioned who can't afford market rents and an awful lot of growth in that lower middle and indeed middle where the markets today is not building for and pricing people out. Um, regional context, again, just to really briefly recap, you know, the city has a steadily diminishing share of greater Toronto households and it's a very particular slice, right? The city has significantly more low-income households and rented dwellings, and it has vastly more private rental apartment buildings and social housing. It has more gentrification. It actually doesn't have really relatively a lot more top quintile households. Long-run trends, we could pick out many. Um, I didn't put gentrification on here because I'm sure it's in your mind. Wider housing disparities are mirroring broader economic trends in the labor market and that sort of thing. I'm wondering if Alan will touch on that. You know, we've seen deep sustained retrenchment from active policy over the past generation. This aging post-war rental stock, which other speakers will touch on, is just a huge part of our Toronto, right? It's about a quarter of the housing stock in the city. Um, we are in a housing system where for the past decade, two decades really, you know, the net additions we get to the rental housing stock are essentially byproducts of speculative, you know, condo buyers. Um, I don't think it's a great system. And then we have this social housing sector, i.e. community housing, nonprofit and public housing. It's small, it's 5% of total housing in the, in the region, a little more in the city. It's less than 2% of production. Right, so it's totally true. And a lot of people don't perhaps realize over the past 20 years, it's pretty much been socially transformed into a very, uh, you know, a population with very high social and support needs. <laughs> and then medium term trends, right? We have, um, as everyone knows, escalating health prices, um, you know, reaching sort of levels that really are squeezing people, you know, in a big way, right? And so that has caused a dramatic shift back to more people renting. People can't afford to buy. That's helped propel lots of rent escalation and adding condo rental, right? 
And so cascading squeeze on two groups, people with low incomes, and new entries to the market, right? And that's young people, it's migrants from elsewhere in Canada, and it's immigrants. And so growth by tenure. I want to flag 1996 to 2006 on the left, right, where not only was, it, okay, there was a decline in the, in the number of rented, ha rental households and rented dwellings, first time ever in Toronto's history, right? And that reinforced a very low political priority for concern about rental housing. Um, that then reversed big time. I'm showing 2006 to 16 on that second blue bar in the left-hand graph. Um, but post 2011, right, it's of net additions to, house, to households, it's 60% of renting, right? Like it's just this huge pressure on the rental sector associated with high ownership prices and, and also uh, other demand factors. And then the shifting to higher rents, and part of this is just rent inflation, but it's also the addition of upmarket condo units, right? That's the graph on the right. And so then, who does what? I'm not going to talk about this graph, uh, this funny chart, but I just want to point out that, you know, what the city does is very entwined with what the province and the municipality, uh, sorry, the province and the federal government do, and we, we can't escape that when we look at the city's uh, strategy now or in future. And so I want to f spend a few minutes just going through um, uh, Greg's erratic uh, history of, you know, the world in affordable housing in Toronto over the last 20 years. Um, <coughs> different people could well have different takes on this. I, I want to take it in five-year periods, which you see, and then I want to take these five sort of areas of affordable housing, social housing, affordable rental development, repair and retrofit, homelessness and supportive housing, land use and regulatory matters, which is a big bundle, and note the formal strategies, formal official strategies as well. Um, so we'll spend like four slides going through this stuff. And these happen under governments of different stripes at all levels, which sometimes, but not always, really affected what happened. And so let's take three areas first, uh, and we'll carry this through two slides, right? So in the blue, we've got existing social housing. In the yellow, we've got affordable and development, and then we've got also repair and retrofit. So in the sort of first five years after amalgamation, big things happen in these first two areas. We have devolution from the federal and provincial governments to the city. Three elements. It's not just the stock that Toronto Community Housing owns and operates, right? It's funding almost half a billion dollars a year. And uh, it's the administration, right? You don't just splash a half billion dollars a year around sort of mindlessly. There's a lot of accountability and oversight involved. Um, and then affordable rental development, right? New frameworks, i.e. new sort of arrangements as to how funding would be provided and who would do the activity were set in place at the federal provincial level and at the city level in this period of 1998 to 2003, right? So the, what was originally called AHP Affordable Housing Program, later became IAH, Investment in Affordable Housing. That is the program for building new affordable rental. It basically carried through to almost today. And that was set in place then. And that's the federal provincial, and then the city's frameworks too, the way it provides land, development charge exemptions, takes some of this development charges, revenues uses, capital, tax, and so on. That was all set in place then. It hasn't fundamentally changed. It's certainly been modified. Um, once we get into 2004 to 2009, uh, region park redevelopment starts, right? And that's a quite a big move. Um, and I would note that the peak of federal provincial funding for new affordable happens in 2007 to 2011. In the 20 years we're talking about, that's when it happens, under Harper as it happens. Um, not particularly due to any housing policy objectors, but as it happens, under Harper. Um, I think at the bottom right there I've got a thing, it's not a policy move, but it's a kind of a policy challenge neglected by default thing, the disrepair hitting a critical point. So moving on to 2010 to 2014, Existing social housing, some, some big stuff is happening, apart from, of course, Rob Ford's political mudstorm at TCHC. It was his first political mudstorm, the stuff he did at TCHC, Toronto Community Housing. The expiring of existing funding arrangements and agreements is hitting a critical point in this period. The Liberal Ontario government uploads quite a bunch of social services costs for municipalities, but explicitly not housing subsidy costs. 
Um, and then in the affordable rental development in the yellow, you know, we've got lower federal provincial funding in this period and through to today pretty much for affordable rental development, right? We, we don't have the volumes of funding that we had in that 2007 to 11 period. But then also in that 2010 to, to 14 period in the yellow, you know, TCHC development has turn, turns in, in this period, turns into an ongoing program, right? They're doing a pretty steady ongoing program of 400 units a year and 1,000 units a year of infill market housing on those sites. Um, in the yellow, closer to today on the right, you know, we've got the open door. So higher output but shallower rents because there's less capital to achieve lower rents. And then housing now, big emphasis on city sites and a more concerted city effort. We'll maybe talk more about that today, I'm sure. Um, tower renewal pilot, in, down in the, uh, the brownish green, whatever color it is, <laughs> brownish beige. Tower renewal pilot, it starts in 2008, and that's, that's moving, that continues going, right? Um, in the bottom right quadrant, Toronto Community Housing Capital Repair goes into the city's capital budget under Mayor Tory, and we're talking 160 million, now up to 173 million per year, right? It's, it was a huge move, a move that, you know, for example, Miller and certainly Ford never made. And again, much higher federal funding for repair now. Um, let's cut to a couple of other areas, homelessness and supportive housing, right? So homelessness is not just about shelter, it's about how do you ho house people with very high needs of, if they're chronically homeless or episodically, of addictions and mental illness and so on, right? So in the early years post-amalgamation, we had um, the start of a federal homeless program. The city was actually putting 20% uh, of that money into creating more supportive housing, which it wasn't able to do under federal rules under Harper. Um, and the provincial government's adding a few units every year, um, every couple years, I should say, to that system that they run for uh, high needs groups. 2004 onwards, the city starts into streets to home. So in other words, you know, workers, you know, really make an effort to go out and, you know, work with people on the streets, and there's a similar thing in the shelters, and, you know, put them directly into housing, right? It's that housing first principle. And that's, that's not like building housing, but there, it's an important move in regard to housing. In the green, land use and regulatory policy, in, in the immediate post-amalgamation uh, years, the city did a couple of things. There was a brief period of, of uh, opportunity and they put the protection of existing rental housing into the official plan policies as they had been pre-amalgamation, right? And that was an important safeguard. And they also made second suites as a right in most areas, not I think R1 areas or something, but in most areas. And they instituted a large sites policy, a sort of little early dipping into into inclusionary policies. Um, moving in these two areas, moving forward, um, 2010 to 2014 in the, uh, in the pinkish color, a uh, huge amount of use of short-term housing allowances for homeless people. So in other words, you're moving someone out of a shelter with a, a little shallow rent subsidy that's gonna help, help them you know, have a stable housing arrangement for at least a few months and, and, and so on. Um, in that period, we get a provincial strategy down at the bottom, long-term affordable housing strategy, not much in it, and we get hot housing opportunities, Toronto, and we can no doubt talk about how much was or wasn't in that. And then toward the end here, 2015 to 19, um, I'm going to say more about some of this in a minute, but Home for Good, that's net, significant net new provincial money for housing homeless people. And then land use and regulatory, we get this new apartment bylaw, right? The uh, so-called rent safe, right? Proactive systematic inspections, very much responding to a strong advocacy campaign. Um, we have the start of seriously looking at second suites and rented rooms, so-called multi-tenant houses, but it, it sinks uh, politically before it goes anywhere. And then we have Ontario coming out with an inclusionary zoning policy that the city can use. And then we have the National Housing Strategy federally in 2017, and the s Provincial Long-Term Affordable Housing Strategy 2016. Um, so here we are, housing, uh, housing TO. It's a very different political moment from uh, a decade ago in Housing Opportunities Toronto, right? You know, as Jeremy talked about the extreme problems in the housing market 
And the question, of course, is how different are the priorities and attitudes and fiscal capacities of governments, with which many people here today are trying to influence. If you look at housing strategies, you know, across Ontario municipalities or broader, you can take different approaches, right? You can have a lot of sort of goal statements and principles. And it seems to me that here in <coughs> Canada, we, we like sort of big, bold goal statements and principles. And, you know, I always want to look at them and say, well, are there resources to implement those? Then there's the sort of kitchen sink approach and, you know, where you sort of list all the good things you, you want to do, you know. Um, but the trouble with that is that, you know, if everything's a priority, nothing's a priority. And I would say that HOT is a bit of a mix of the goal statements and principles and the kitchen sink. You know, they've got like a couple of hundred so-called actions, which are specific sort of implementation things. But, you know, where does that take you? I tend to favor a strategy that's a few selected strategic moves. But that only works if you really got some political leadership and, and capital and momentum, you know. And so maybe, maybe HOT doing the first two was as good as it could get in 2009, but maybe we can do the other in 2019. Um, can I just ask for a time check? Um, may I? Um, I'm not... Okay, okay. So I'm going to just highlight a few things of federal and provincial policy. Um, talk about the last, more or less, period since Housing Opportunities Toronto and sort of where we're at now, right? So Ontario housing policy, we talked about the fact there was no upload of housing subsidy costs, also no more download. And the announcements this provincial government made in April essentially continuing that, right? They're not downloading any more affordable housing costs onto the city, they're continuing the money that, that was flowing, it's gonna keep flowing. And when I say flowing, like things have to flow every year, right? Rent subsidies, you know, you know, doing new affordable housing, you know, this has gotta happen every year, it doesn't happen in one time lump sums once in a while, right? The Ontario government was a very passive partner of the federal government doing the minimum cost sharing of those federal programs and basically, the, the, this new provincial government has announced that they're going to do the same, right? But they're not creating a barrier to letting those federal, federal, federal funding, uh, that federal funding flow. Um, I'm going to skip along here. Um, inclusionary zoning, uh, we'll hear about that this afternoon. One starting point, it wasn't eliminated. <laughs> How much promise there is to implement it, I don't know. Um, mental health and chronic homeless, this provincial government has made promises on mental health and housing supports and also has earmarked restricted federal dollars they've received. So there's room for some cautious optimism on that front. Uh, rent control, you guys know. Um, I won't talk about community housing renewal. So the national housing strategy, everybody's heard of it of course. What were the main elements and what do they mean for Toronto, right? So one is the Canada or the Ontario, it's called the Canada Ontario Community Housing Initiative. So the federal funding, the federal subsidies that help sustain affordable rents and do some of the repair, those subsidies were phasing out under the devolution agreement signed in the 90s. That was a problem, a huge problem. This initiative, CCHI, backfills those subsidies and more or less keeps them going, right? So this stabilizes an acute fiscal pressure on the city, right? So the city's net, net of its federal transfers and stuff, net spending on social housing subsidies rose by 80% in the last decade. You know, it rose by 80% and huge fiscal pressure. Now the city has other fiscal pressures <laughs> as you've been hearing about in there, but it actually doesn't have fiscal pressure specifically within the housing envelope in the next, let's say five years, the way it has had in the past 10 years. National Housing Co-Investment Fund for New Construction, um, two things. The, the, the dollars are modestly higher than before, not greatly higher. And secondly, there's a complication in the delivery. The repair and retrofit funding, and we'll hear from Graham, I guess, uh, this afternoon, is very much increased. It's hugely increased. Um, I'll skip the next one. The Canada Housing Benefit, so this is portable subsidies to people with low incomes to help afford housing. That is apparently going to go forward under this government. Now, we don't know how much the Ontario government will match the federal dollars, but they've announced that it's gonna go forward in some way. I wanna touch on market housing policy. And 
you know, so they brought in these mortgage stress tests, right, for home buyers. It's helping to moderate the price escalation in the market, but flip side, that's keeping a lot more uh, demand in the rental sector. Um, the national housing strategy was all about sort of, sort of quasi non-market, moderately affordable stuff and, and housing subsidies. It wasn't about managing the housing market to alleviate the kind of dysfunctions that we've got in Greater Toronto or Greater Vancouver or so on. Um, skipping down to Ontario policy, I'm going to say there's there's no market housing strategy, right? They've just announced a, you know, housing supply action plan. You know, deregulation strategy is not uh, a housing supply strategy, right? It could have a good effect here or there, where there's bad ones, but it's not a housing supply strategy. And the growth plan, right? Greater uh, growth plan for greater, greater holding short golden horseshoe. You've got a growth plan without a housing strategy, you know? Well, more of the same to follow. So a couple of notes on three areas of policy before I close. The city role in new affordable housing development. Pre-national pre housing strategy, so until last year, you know, the city came up with some of its own funds and land and then it got a large amount of, not a large amount, it got federal and provincial funding and sort of put them together and did proposal calls. And those were the, the funds that, and land and tax exemptions that both private and nonprofit developers doing affordable housing used, right? And the city administered that and ran that and did the 500-ish units a year. Under the National Housing Strategy, it's quite different. There's sort of two systems in parallel, and one is a bit like the one we just had, except without the federal money administered by the city. And the other one, which is the big, the big action, is the, the piece on the right, you know, where the federal government, through Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation, is running its own show in terms of affordable housing development, right? Proponents who want to get that money have to come up with money from elsewhere. There's a strong, large matching funding requirements, right? For example, they might get it from the city, but it's a separate system. It's not delivered as one unified system. So this is this may sound like an administrative technicality, but it's kind of going to be a huge barrier to figure out, you know, how we get to high volumes of affordable housing development if if we've got this uncoordinated system. And then there's a the city role in social housing. We are at a point of huge risk and opportunity in regard to social housing, and it's not about TCHC repair. Uh, the city has a four-part role in social housing. Right. It's not just about running TCHC. When I mentioned devolution, I mentioned the funding, I mentioned the admin and oversight. And, you know, implicitly there's a huge strategic role that the city has to play too. So it's got a, a four-part role. And then, so public and nonprofit housing, you know, if you wind the clock back to two decades ago, it took huge subsidies because we're still paying off huge mortgages, right? Not for the old public housing, but for most of the stuff that was built in the 70s, 80s. And now, either those mortgages are mostly paid off, or they paid off five years from now, or the debt service payments are pretty low by now. And so that housing, like most social housing around the world, can now break even, even including repairs and stuff, well below market rent, right? Toronto Community Housing breaks even at like under 1,100 per unit per month, you know, including like major capital repairs, right? Compared to a market average of, you know, 1,400 for, you know, old rental. And, and so it becomes um, a very economical proposition. It becomes also a proposition where the asset value and cash flow can be levered to help pay for, for new housing, but it, it takes a strategy to get there. And then there's the homelessness and supportive housing. And the city of Toronto has quite a significant role in this area. I won't go through all these little, little icons, but it, it does, ha does have quite a significant role. And the challenge then for the city is to somehow figure out how to put the resources together to, to add, and that could be building or buying or long-term leasing, housing that's earmarked and targeted to people who have, um, you know, experience of chronic and episodic homelessness, have, um, have uh, mental illness and have serious addictions, right? And so the city's got to figure out how those promised provincial support dollars and the national housing strategy dollars that kind of aren't flowing in the same system and the city's own resources can be orchestrated to help um, solve the homeless problem. So there are opportunities. I've spoken about 
three areas just now, and then other speakers today will speak about some of these other areas, protecting existing rental, protecting tenants and tenancies, the whole uh, complicated but important areas of second suites and rented rooms, tower renewal, and inclusionary zoning. So hope that's a useful um, retrospective to folks, and uh, uh, thanks for the opportunity to speak to you this morning. <laughs>